This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, February 15th, 2024. OGM means Open Global Mind. We uh, have a check-in format today, which means uh, I will describe our check-in routine in a second, uh, but we don't have a particular topic. We alternate weeks, so next week will be a topic. But we do have, uh, in two hours, so after this call, a specific topic call, in fact, is the beginning of a series of four calls on the topic of governance. And anyone who would like to come in, it's the same Zoom as this in two hours. And this call should last 90 minutes. Now I need to figure out how to get rid of the little transcript that's showing up in the bottom of my screen. Welcome. Huh. There we go. <clears throat> um, how is everybody? Just before we go into the check-in round, how are y'all holding up? Okay, Scott's got a thumbs up. That's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, excellent. Good. Agilla is medium rare, up and down. <laughs> mostly, mo has, mostly uh, solid, but it varies. Ken Homer has attained a high-speed wobble. I'll elaborate during check-in. Stacy, what part of the planet do we find you in this morning? North Carolina. Sweet. With computer issues. <laughs> Uh-oh, not so sweet. <clears throat> nice to see you all. Uh, today is check-in format. So let us uh, step into that. And um, normally we've done a sort of a slow check-in, uh, each of us as uh, as we used to do. And I'm going to ask that as we check in, we sort of focus our thoughts a little bit and head toward something that is top of mind for us that we're working on and just re report in with a little bit more brevity. And that will give us time because usually when we're, when we're doing check-ins lately, we eat all of our time in check-in and don't get to do any discussion. <clears throat> so I would love us to be a little more focused uh, in the check-ins. And again, the, the general routine for check-ins is I will step out. So it's up to you all to step into the conversation. Feel free to take pauses between the check-ins. The pauses are special and interesting. Uh, do not check in twice during the check-in round. Uh, I'm I'm sort of watching to make sure everybody checks in. Every now and then I mess that up and forget somebody, but uh, that works out pretty well. And then let's try not to use the chat very much uh, during the check-in part of the call. I will release us all into normal conversation at the end of, of check-in. Then we can, if you want to take your notes in a separate notes app, then that's a good time to sort of paste your uh, your notes or whatever else you wanted into the chat uh, then. I will occasionally use the chat to welcome somebody who comes into the call and doesn't know what we're up to and explain a little bit of the process. But other than that, um, this is usually pretty self-steering. Um, did I forget any parts of the of our re regular routine. Cool. So again, I'm asking us to be a little bit more focused and pithy in our check-ins to go like with a, a, the thing that's top of mind, and then we'll have a chance to talk more when we uh, when we've done the check-in. With that, I'm going to apply mute to myself, which is a new topical cream, um, and uh, see who wants to jump in first. Oh, and please use the electronic hands to form a queue, or if there's no queue, then do step in. But the electronic hand raised is actually our, our way of knowing who's next uh, in the check-ins. Thanks, Scott. All right, well, I guess I don't need to pause for reflection after your introduction. <clears throat> so um, why I'm feeling good right now. I've decided, well, I've I've re-connected um, with my love of beauty. So I like beautiful things. And that could be everything from visuals to sounds, smells, all kinds of good stuff. And to that end, I have a nice little window right behind me, looks out to the woods. And I've done some things, like I got myself a nice little pair of binoculars. Once in a while, I just turn around and look at the trees. It makes me happy. It makes me so happy. I can't even 
explain it. I took three college, three classes in, in high school with photography, took a couple of classes. I'm a graphic designer. That's always been interesting to me. I found a brand new camera that has a retro look to it. It looks like the camera that I bought in 1984 to do that stuff. It has these little dials that I can click and turn and, you know, it's not a tap screen. It actually is physical. I'm now back into photography as opposed to tapping pictures on my phone. It's engaged me with my environment. I can take a photo of a chair that's in the living room and suddenly there's an aesthetic enjoyment of the beauty of this form. Um, I have a... Oh, my little favorite little bowl, which has been sitting on a shelf at the bottom of the living room. And now it's back in my office. And it's one thing that I can tap every now and again and just feel that that little beauty just for a moment. Um, so it's something that I've really enjoyed. Um, I, I put a little keyboard in my desktop that I can use to play around with. So that's something that I've been doing is to try to, instead of squeezing it into spaces, little tiny corners, make it something that I enjoy in moments all day long. Um, so as far as project updates, um, I have about 35,000 words written for my framework of frameworks book. And I'm now going through the editing process, which is more challenging than the writing process. Because how short do you make it? How long do you make it? What do you include and not include? So I'm enjoying that, but I'm finding it difficult because I completed it in a sense. I completed the first draft and now there's a certain amount of motiv motivation and momentum that is lost because the first draft is done. And so I'm trying to re-engage and get back that, get that back together. So that's me. Thanks. Well, I guess I'll go. I had my hand raised. <clears throat> I was sort of waiting for teacher to call on me, but the teacher has the mute cream on. <clears throat> so a thing I'm doing that I like a lot is doing reels. At well, I live on a river, and so I'm going out and just seeing what's new and different that I am looking at or on, on my piece of a river that I walk on, I live on. And I'm getting up to like a thousand views a day. It's kind of crazy. Lots of people I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I, they don't tell you how many, uh, who, who likes it. They, they don't tell you who views it. They tell you, you know, the, the few who like it. So that's interesting. The project I'm really having super fun with is uh, figuring out how to distribute a, a watershed dividend in the Swannanoa River watershed that we'll be getting from the sale of carbon on uh, local farms. And um, it has two parts. Uh, the money from the, the carbon will be given in a, in a land back tax with some folks who work with the local Cherokee and we'll figure out other things beyond there. And then the community will figure out what to do with uh, the watershed dividend and what they should spend on first, but it needs to enhance the viability of the local small farmers that are in our zero uh, interest loan platform. So, you know, soil health, water health, uh, social determinants of health next to the river and places where, you know, there's bad drainage and other things like that. So uh, gathering a group meeting every other week, but uh, there's drill down groups now starting with people who really know things. 
And we, the, the watershed fund has hired somebody who is both a permaculture farmer and a Harvard MBA and MPA. And, you know, you don't need to, some, you can actually learn some good things at Harvard and, and some approaches. And so, you know, they don't, don't, don't think badly just because they're, she's got the two masters from Harvard. Because <clears throat> um, she really, you know, I think will help guide this process. And my daughter is going to help guide the conversations around it, keep it interactive. And she can be an expert and, uh, BJ will help people, you know, do the interactive thing, you know, break into small groups and discuss and listen and all that stuff that I wouldn't have thought of, but she's going to be good at. So, okay, that's it. Bye. Morning, everybody, and good evening, Hank. I, I, whoops, sorry, my screen is doing something. Uh, I don't know if this violates the protocol, but I want to just want to say, Kevin, I am deeply inspired by what you're up to there. Um, the thanks. Uh, I mean, both the both the, the general approach and the specifics and how you're doing it. It's just really it's it's thrilling and rich, and I think there's an you know very very important feeds there for lots of other stuff. So thank you for that. And yeah. thanks for doing it with us the way you're doing it. I, I would just say quickly, I think people will be able to deal with a regular infusion of abundance at the system level better than they can argue about scarce resources in the world they see. So that that's my premise. That's mm -hmm. as much of a theory of change as I have and then let other people figure out from there. Yeah, and that, um, that so yeah. Com commenting on what Kevin said is rock and roll. Let's not fall into conversation, please. Let's just yeah. make the check-in round. Well, and I, I, I like that Kevin broke protocol with this comment on my illegal comment because that was good, a good, a, 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 a good seal with a kiss on top of the thing. So, um, 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 top of mind for me, oh, golly, top of mind for me is make sure I don't run out of electrons. Somebody else go next, and I'll come back. Okay. Well, maybe I go next. Um, so the the this this next iteration of uh, engagement, you know, in the in the climate, um, food and agriculture sector, is really dependent on building networks. Uh, that can collaborate and just like Kevin is also doing you need you need uh, specialists um, with with very specific know-how to to come to come together and in a perfect world um, you want to find projects that have that create excitement that uh, that show potential um, and 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 come from this abundance uh, theory uh, the perspective. So one thing that um, I'm currently working on is to connect a supply chain from farmers, grain farmers, with a flour mill operator, with a company that's called Plantup, that is extracting proteins out of plant-based materials with a CPG operator that is a, a consumer packaged goods operator that is using raw materials to put it into um, to put into consumer products, you know, frozen, canned, whatever. And to create this consistent supply chain because what is literally exploding in the food business is plant-based protein extracts um, and, and fermented foods. Uh, meats uh, using fermentation uh, for 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 proteins, and the source material um, is typically coming from soy and corn from commodity crops, which are highly damaging. So, by turning this whole design upside down and starting with farmers, uh, informing the project what they need to grow to restore their soil back to health, and then. And then aligning that with a customized uh, milling capacity, 
uh, and a plant tub that can extract protein out, out of just about anything, uh, any type of, of uh, grain and sunflowers and you name it. And then, and then aligning that with a CPG manufacturer who then brings market information back and forth about what are the most uh, uh, promising part, products that you can put out on the market. So to create this net, this line of uh, farm to table. And so we have aligned now um, a farming co-op in the Palouse you know, with a, uh, we are negotiating with, uh, with flour mills um, to do a customized, uh, right-sized uh, facility. Blendtub is in the picture. Blendtub is a company that uses Siemens technology. Uh, it, it, Siemens invented a, a technology that uh, is on a, mounted on a 40-foot container, can be shipped anywhere out of the factory. Um, and and uh, into the protein extraction. Plus, they already have installations in several countries: Mexico, India, Indonesia, and so on. So they they are um, uh, they, are, they have been trying to get into the North American market and haven't been able to figure out how to do it. So so to so I see this kind of of uh, aligning of uh, 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 people that of of companies. That have shared interests, complementary interests, uh, as a way to move forward and and build something. So we are we are setting this up as a pilot project. Uh, the the entire emphasis here is on building replicability of this model, and we have some amazing partners in the Palouse because there are two extensions, Washington State and Idaho uh, uh, University extensions. Yeah, so that's that's sort of my thought. Let's do something, right? Let's just like Kevin. Let's just work on something. Uh, we have been talking for years about how bad everything yeah. is. Uh, you just got to you know, put some rubber on the road. Do you have a link somewhere you could drop in the chat? Uh, yeah, I can. Thank you. So I'm I'm back I'm back and I have electrons. Class, uh, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> um, several things top of mind for me. One is the election, of course. Um, nine nine months to major turning points, perhaps in the world we live in. Uh, I'm finding that I'm doing uh, less news and more music uh, as part of my strategy for engaging that world. Uh, so Scott, yay on yay on beauty. Thank you for that share. Have we lost Scott? No. Um, um, and on the music note, I discovered last night something called WebAmp. I don't know if people have seen it, but I tracked down, I followed a link to a, a Grateful Dead concert with Branford Marsalis. Mm, sweet. Um, link, link went to Internet Archive. Internet Archive said you have a choice of listening to it this way or WebAmp, and WebAmp is phenomenal much higher quality um uh, of, of music and lots of you know lots of control panel controls if you want to play with that sort of thing so there's that um other thing top of mind for me is um is approaching my coaching work as a business not as an activity um, and really trying to crank that up into something that is stable uh and uh reliable uh, and a source of revenue that can enable me to then do the other wilder and more entrepreneurial things that I uh, have, um, you know, that I feel called to do but can't focus on because uh, of needing to stabilize cash flow. So that's underway. <clears throat> I can talk more about the specifics of that another time, but it's 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 gratifying and already bearing fruit. Um, and I will mention, Jerry, you'll tell me if I'm out of bounds here, that we welcome referrals and reward them. Um, I'll pay finders fees either to you or to your favorite NGO uh, for any referrals that come to me. Um, and if folks are interested, I can provide a link uh, to stuff on that. The other thing interesting about coaching, though, is as I've said before, I've been, um, like a lot of us, doing a lot of work of, of using and exploring uh, and building AIs. Uh, and so we're a couple of months into a project of... Um, uh, of building what I think is a pretty sophisticated coaching bot. 
you know, a lot of people doing these these days, but the approach we're taking feels distinctive, not, not like anything I've seen before. Uh, it's really rich um, in, in what it's offering, um, but it's also fascinating the process of building it. I'm working with a guy who comes out of a programming world <clears throat> um, who tends to think uh, in terms of mechanistic algorithms, if then, kinds of loops, nested if then loops. And uh, in my experience, human conversation is something much less definable than that. There are aspects of that in it. I mean, you know, if I if I go off the rails, Jerry is going to bring me back and say this is a check-in call. There's you know, there's things you could define as if thens, but there's something much messier and cloudier and emergent in human conversations. Um, and so we're exploring how to capture that, and it's a very interesting design tension uh, between the, um, uh, for want of a better word, I'll say the programmatic and the emergent. Uh, and so we are both um, building something and also exploring a space that I've never been in and learning a lot reflexively about what it is that I do in conversations, what happens in conversations, um, what supports the richness of the emergent human experience. So um, we're, uh, we're, we, we, we demoed the Living Between Worlds AI, um, Ken and I, uh, in, in a call in December. That's going to continue to evolve and, and get exposed sooner. The coaching thing is down the road a ways, but at some point I'd love to bring it here uh, and give you all a chance to kick the tires and um, tell us what we're what we're missing. Um, so, and yeah, I just you know I'm giving a lot of attention to conversations and not just the 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 speaking aspect of it but the listening about learning learning a lot about how to listen deeply and how to listen not just for do i like what you said does it fit my worldview can i do something with it but listen for in a much more open process of discovery um, um, curiosity even across uh, apparent big differences between humans uh, which actually will pertain on our governance conversation but since we're not allowed to talk about that i'll stop now I'll try to be brief as suggested. Uh, two, two quick uh, thoughts. One, had uh, meetings the last couple of weeks with the folks at Hilo, um, and yesterday met with uh, them and our development folks, and I think we've got uh, maybe the starting of a, a new relationship that will help to uh, integrate some of the work we've been doing with the work they're doing, and uh, hopefully we can find ways to support one another um, at some foundational stuff, which sounds promising. So I'm excited about that. Um, second um, is uh, the the Serving Life booklet. Had the opportunity uh, over the last couple of weeks to speak with three or four folks, including Hank, uh, about um, the booklet. Um, the Society 2045 folks have been uh, discussing it as well. So we, we're uh, getting further down the road with it. And um, and this week got really excited about the the promise with uh, Neil books being a really good fit for, for what we're thinking. So um, it's feeling more and more like it's it's uh, it it sinks in uh, like uh, with what we were hoping to do. So that's uh, that's feeling that the technology piece and the content piece are really starting to to come together and uh, look forward to bringing some more information to you folks about participating as well. And that's it for me. Thank you. Good morning, all. It's good to see you. A um, uh, couple things going on for me. Uh, Plex is coming out next Wednesday, and I'm looking for people to describe communities they're in, um, kind of like a journalist. Uh, and it can be a really short description, like a paragraph or something like that. 
uh, maybe you want to check. I, I, I like the idea actually of it's not an official description. Uh, it's somebody in the community saying, hey, this is the community I'm in and here's some of the stuff that's going on and you should check it out because um, uh, check, you know, check if that's okay to do with your community leader, but um, send me an email uh, if you can, if you can do that for a community that you're in. Um, I'm peripherally involved kind of in, in some book stuff, uh, neo books, and then an AI collaborative, collectively written AI book uh, that we published uh, via, kin uh, via Kindle direct publishing. It's actually a, a paperback um, first, and it'll be a Kindle soon. So I've got an Amazon author page up because of that, which is an interesting um, place to be. Um, and separately from Neo Books and the AI book, uh, Jordan Sukut has been looking to publish some of his, his books from his uh, Lionsburg wiki uh, into, uh, into ebooks and print. And so I'm working with him. Uh, you know, we, we took a project to get one of them published uh, this month. Uh, taking it from Obsidian all the way through, you know, you can buy it um, online. So as part of that project this week, it was like, well, we kind of rolled up our sleeves and I, I um, snow plowed into how to publish a book on uh, Lulu. And uh, Jared and I spent about an hour and a half doing that together. And then um, he took some homework to write a better sample book. We were, we just made up a 14 page dumb, you know, like literally AI generated mush thing um, to, to try. And we didn't click publish, but I said, you know, the next step is to make this a little bit better and then click publish and then buy it from ourselves and see, you know, whether we like the feel of it, how the buying process goes. So like two days after, <laughs> after Jordan and I had that uh, exercise together, he, he messaged me, he said, Hey Pete, I published the book. <laughs> so, um, during that process, it was really interesting because, you know, in, in one sense, we're all kind of used to the idea that anybody can go to a blog, uh, a web page or something and say something to the world, but it still feels a little bit different when it's, you know, a book that you could buy and it's in print and stuff like that. So um, at some point during that process, you know, we got ready to push the print button, but it wasn't, wasn't printable book kind of. Jordan said, wow, this is weird, you know, like we have the power of the press, you know, and it's like some of that kind of old legacy feel for, you know, what a book is came back and rushing back. And then later, you know, later in the week, he's like, okay, well, I push, publish the book, we'll move on to the next milestone, you know, now we're going to publish a bunch of books. Um, I'm super excited about AI still. That's where I'm spending most of my time. Um, I'm, I've started teaching um, in a community called AI Salon. I'm teaching people how to get started with AI and do different cool stuff with it, uh, both language bots and image bots. Um, I'm trying to get some of that to turn into paid classes and paid seminars. Um, and then I'm also trying to figure out how um, every day, each day, every day, I see like dozens of objectively beautiful things that I've created with Midjourney. And it frustrates the heck out of me not to be able to share them effectively with people. Um, and the problem there is, you know, it's, it's cool if Pete sends you one or two pictures in an email, but what if Pete sends you, you know, a dozen or two dozen or, or 50 or, or 100? At some point, you know, the, like, Pete, I can only look at so many objectively beautiful things uh, before I, I, you know, I'm complete. Um, so, and that, that range is different for different people. And I think part of it is some of the people that I need to be reaching are also going to be making, you know, their own stuff. Um, so that's been really frustrating. Um, that's where I'm stuck right now. I'm not stuck. I'm doing stuff, but um, <coughs> stuck delivering on what I want to deliver. Um, I think it's pretty obvious at this point, as I see more and more people adopt AI stuff, um, there's going to be a, a big chunk of it, which is kind of just like it's going to go into the background and it's going to be part of your search experience and part of your email experience and part of your drafting experience with documents. There's another level where you actually go in and use the AI a little bit more assertively than it's just helping you in the background doing stuff. And that helping you do stuff, um, sorry, 
being more assertive with it, using it as a tool for crafting, doing creative stuff um, and design stuff with the tools um, is something that's going to help people be more human. So that's the really cool part of where we are with generative AI. Um, it's fun to talk about, oh my God, the AIs are gonna take over and rule the world. And we're not even close to that. But it's really easy to see also that it's going to be a really generative force for, and make lots of people be able to do things that they couldn't do before. So that's exciting. Uh, thanks, that's me. Some really good uh, tech in so far. Glad to hear about all the things that are top of attention for people. Uh, as I've said in the last couple of times I've been in the conversation, the, the importance of thinking about and renewing ideas about governance and democracy are very top of mind these days. Uh, next Tuesday, I'm flying to Iceland to help facilitate a conference and a lab about that. Uh, and today, uh, spent uh, a couple of hours drawing up a kind of survey of values and cultures, uh, which we're going to ask uh, uh, the 70 or 80 people who attend the conference to fill out, to get some feeling about how people say or think their values are and what they actually do in, uh, in daily practice. But the thing that's extremely top of mind uh, these days is uh, also related to democracies and governance. Uh, yesterday, we had an Oracy Lab conversation uh, about the following question. Uh, do people in democracies have the right to not see, to look away, to deny, to ignore, to not be bothered? Do they have the right to remain silent, to not speak up? And we had six people from six different countries took part in a hundred minute conversation. Uh, some of them were older democracies, some of them were uh, newer democracies, but they all considered themselves democracies. And uh, I will hopefully write something about that for the biweekly plex, not this next one, but one uh, coming up uh, further away in March. But my takeaways were very interesting, at least for me. Uh, we know lots of ways to involve people in open, honest conversations with deep listening and uh, uh, questioning the meaning of the things they say. But we have almost no idea how to do the same things with larger groups, with groups of hundreds or thousands of people for broad societal conversations. And I think that's something the world should be practicing and prototyping and experimenting with in the coming months and years. Uh, People, as was said in the conversation, are very often in the selfish corner, but how do you help people get out of the selfish corner? And democracies guarantee their <coughs> citizens' rights not to speak up. Uh, they have the right to look as way as much as they want. So we have to think a lot more deeply about that and what rights and responsibilities and obligations for citizens uh, in democracies might be. And uh, as last one, how to stimulate large scale conversations about the idea of a bill of responsibilities or a bill of human obligations, as probably you know, the UNDP uh, wrote papers and published them online about seven or eight years ago about uh, the Declaration of Human Responsibilities and the Declaration of Human Obligations. And they've never entered the, the popular common conversations that people have. And is it 
useful and is it easy to do that? Uh, and just one other item that came out of uh, that ORC conversation, we always talk about getting people out of the box, but often people and ourselves end up talking in circles. So how do you get people thinking out of the circle? Uh, that's my take in for now. So my screen is a little weird and I can't tell whether I'm up, but I'm, I think I might be next. Um, what's on my mind a lot is oil company executives. How come there's no public dialogue with them about what they're doing with climate change? Uh, why can't we demand uh, that they be in a public discussion? Why doesn't the New York Times say on its editorial page, what are you guys really thinking? So here we have major agents in society who are totally not in the public conversation about what's happening. Uh, I find that pretty weird and distressing. And I'll stop there. Jerry, I don't know if you saw this, but Eve, you can go anytime you'd like. <laughs> you could just jump right in. Well, thank you. I love this group. And every Thursday morning when I have something scheduled, I say, I can't believe I'm missing this. So I'm glad to be here, um, even though I only have 20 minutes or 22 minutes to be with you all. Um, yeah. Okay. My check-in, without hearing that many of your check-ins. Um, uh Personally, just loving life um, uh, in my personal life. I, I, you know, surrounded by love and here in the Bay Area in Berkeley, and I still love it. You know, it's a hellscape here, of course. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, but I am working in the space of diversity and inclusion, and I am just flabbergasted at the... Um, attack of something that seems so core to, um, you know, equality is everything and I don't understand. So, you know, just watching what's been going on, um, highlighted November, December and January and thinking, wow, we are here. We are in this really difficult place around that. But that's, that's the only thing I wanted to bring up. Yeah. You reminded me of something that I'm not sure if it's top of mind, but um, last Friday, April and I went to see Origin, a movie by Ava DuVernay about Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. And if you started reading Cast, you're like, there's no way someone makes a movie out of this book because it's an academic work. And they made a, a delight, delightful and heartrending movie out of it. I, we both thought it was really affecting and really good. Um, and the thing that's top of mind that was just reinforced by that is why are humans consistently so shitty to other humans? What is the deal? It's all about power and whatever. I don't know, but I wish we could flush that from the human spirit entirely. And Eve, I'd love to book a call with you sometime and maybe strategize because I think that the whole anti-woke thing is, is strategy. It's very intentional. It's working really well. And I'd love to sort of see if there's ways of of lancing that foil somehow. Um, but top of mind really for me is why are humans so crappy to other humans all the time with very little cause? Uh, thanks. I'm 
I'm I'm wondering if there's a term to describe the kind of person who, if there is an equality, that it just crushes their their whole heart and soul. Like, you know, if it's if that's not the world that in which we live in or strive for or aspire to, um, I wonder if there's a not that we need another othering or group or whatever, but I just uh it's really crushing me crushing you know so yeah. can you ask that question again once a couple more people have checked in uh because the, in the check-in round we try to go once and not enter a conversation and i love your question so if you can bring that back to us when uh like there's four more people i think we haven't gone yet but thank you i'll go because this is kind of relevant and I apologize because Eve will probably have to drop off the line by the time we've done this. So somebody who could channel Eve and we were recording this and we'll post it. And Stacy, I apologize for stepping on you, but it ju I just dawned on me that Eve will be gone in a few minutes. So I was quiet at first because when I came in, my check-in would have been that I'm feeling really nervous, but it was like a nervous excitement. But part of what's causing that is that I've been putting myself into conversations that are more uncomfortable. And as an example, I've recently had one with two separate women and each of the two women had the same message, which I was kind of on the other side of, but with one of them through, because of where she is emotionally and who she is and at a different level, by listening to each other, we were able to see that there was a lot that we did agree on and that we were trying to come up with ways to combine our messages because each had validity to them and share them. The other woman, however, was reacting to what the first woman pointed out was not at a certain level of readiness to do that. And even though this was someone that I have always gotten along with, she went on to say how disappointed she was in me and how incapable I was of, you know, it was just like this whole attack, which is kind of hard to maintain the level I want to interact at and still feel that. So that's causing a little bit of um, my nervousness comes from my uncertainty. So it's um, it just throws me off just just a little bit. Parallel to that, I'm here in North Carolina, and a lot of you know that the very close heart, the person that I am so close to, and we're both on the same frequency as far as hearts go, we have very different political views. And what I did yesterday, because I am interested in democracy and a lot of the things that Hank pointed out, I started reading out loud parts of the conservative 2025 platform project, which is something that I actually want to talk to some of you about at another time, as I see a possible project with some overlapping. But um, so I read it out loud to her. And then we stopped and we I just asked certain questions just to sort of guide her to see how that well-intentioned piece that she might normally agree with could totally have different effects depending on who's in power. And we kind of talked, to, I, I kind of talked about how important it is to have a structure that works regardless of who's in power and that still protects the same things that we agree on need to be protected. So I'll just stop there, but I have a lot on my mind right now.
I guess I'll jump into the quiet. Um, I'm in a period of reflection and uncertainty about how I want to spend my time and energies in the future. Uh, some of my nonprofit involvements have come to the natural term limit ends, and I'm trying to sort through what are the most important issues and opportunities for me to contribute personal energies toward, and on what scale? Do I want to try to stay local, or do I want to move into a lot? Some of my nonprofit work has been national in scale, and the issues are so complex and the unevenness of human communication is so great that I'm finding it really challenging to, to narrow in and home in on how to best contribute to some constructive progress in a specific area. So I'm open to thoughts on how to sort of resort your identity at this advanced stage in life because it's not structured by an external environment as it was when I was working professionally or heavily involved in direct activities with the nonprofits. So I'm in a questioning, open-minded, what are the problems most important to me or the opportunities most important and how might I best contribute to those? Would it be better to do it locally, state level, um, et cetera? So anyone with some wisdom on that, I would welcome. That might be a dimension of governance, by the way, Jerry, because I think that many organizations are facing a change in participation in governance based partly on demographics and values of aging populations and next generation populations and so on. So that might be a dimension that would be worth exploring further. Um, what's on my mind these days is well-being, and I don't have as much of it as I would like at the moment. Um, I got COVID three weeks ago on Tuesday. Um, I'm probably about 85 to 90 percent better, but this last 15 to 10 to 15 percent is really hard climb. I'm just I'm not feeling you know like I'm not nearly as sick as I was, but I wake up and I don't feel great. I don't have a lot of energy, and you know. I was, I'm somebody who usually walks four to six miles a day at three, a little over three miles an hour. I, I work up a sweat and I'm just like drained. And uh, I'm all, in my professional work, I'm, I'm shifting my focus to well being. Uh, I've done enough focus on problems for too long. Um, so, what, you know, my, my wife teaches nutrition and it's a holistic natural nutrition school. And even if you've got terminal cancer, there are things you can do dietarily to ease your journey so that you're not, you know, in so much pain. So I think what if we start to focus on how to bring more well-being into these situations where we see so much pain and suffering, where we see systems collapsing or, or under threat of collapse? Um, because the the fear-based response, oh my God, what are we gonna do? You know, and this is a problem and we have to fix it, doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about well-being. How can I bring more well-being to to my life, to the lives of other people? Um, what kind of coaching offer can I put out for well-being? Uh, I'm developing a, a course. I've actually developed this course three times with three different people, and they've all bailed on me uh, towards the end. And I've got two colleagues I've been working with now um, for over a year, um, and we're pretty close to, to having it complete. Um, and I'm just like, okay, you know, this this has to be... As I look at the next phase of my life, which is, you know, I'm in the third act. I'm six, going to be 67 pretty soon. And, you know, I uh, don't know how much fuel is left in the tank, but I want to make sure it, it's burned in as good a, as, as good a means as possible, doing as, as much good as possible. And it feels like well-being is the place, is a place for me to focus my time and attention and energy. Um, 
which I've, I've been writing about in the plex. You may notice, you know, some people think I'm Pollyanna because I don't want to talk about the problems. I'm not Pollyanna. I know really well in my bones how bad things are. But I also know that that, that is a, creates a mood or a, a, a trapped mood of, oh my God, what are we going to do? And that doesn't connect me to resources. So instead, you know, I, I heard this story about this guy in World War II, became a very famous person. I can't think of his name right now, but he always said, what's, you know, how can this be the best possible thing to happen right now? And he was in, he was Jewish. He was in a building where, where the Nazis came in, they're looking for him. And he normally had big fluffy hair and wore glasses. And he heard the Nazis there. So he ran to the men's room and he took his glasses off and wet his hair back, slicked it back and walked right past him, walked out of the building. He says, you know, how can I use this? He didn't freak out. And I feel like we're all, um, so many of not we're all, so many people are on the, the edge of freaking out about what's going on. And they're not focused on, okay, you know, this, there's really bad stuff happening. How can we bring well being here? So that's becoming my question, my, my quest is uh, for greater well being. Hi, Stacy, go ahead. I may have miscounted, but I think we've all checked in. We have, and I just want to quickly say to Ken's point to tell you all of this series I just found called Resilience, Resilient Cities. And they did one on Beirut, one on Kiev, and I haven't seen the third one, but it's how they're using how they're using art to transform the cities. I just wanted to mention that here. Some of you may enjoy it. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Eve, if you'd like to re-ask your question, we're done with the check-in round and, and game for conversation. Yeah, I don't know if it's as that important. I was just asking the question if there's a term, there's probably a term already out there for people who um, maybe somatically feel um, energetically, the things that are going on, you know, um, and that specifically where equality comes into play, it, it's just a thing. It's always been this way for me when, since I was a little, little, little girl, that if there's not equality, it just crushes me. It's just, an, it's just, it's, it's, it's got this powerful energetic, um, aspect to it for me. I'm sure there's, must be a certain percentage of the population that have that. And I'm wondering if that's a nice place to start <laughs> of those people who, if it really affects them to that level, then maybe they're the people that should actually be doing the work. Uh, and I see a lot of hands up, so. Well, thanks, Eve. I'm Scott, you put your hand up almost immediately then. Uh, please go ahead. All right. I love all these little topics. It's so interesting. Um, so I'm never sure if any of you are all interested in my pedestrian solo interests and pursuits, but you seem to comment about them. So I'll say that that's a ongoing, continuing positive thing to add to the group. Um, so Doug, you were talking about the oil execs not being asked what's going on. How do you explain yourself? Why do you justify all this? And I'm wondering, that's something I think about all the time, is how, how much of the conversation and work doesn't really affect anything at all. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the classic Indiana Jones analysis that says, you know, Indiana Jones didn't change anything. If you take him out of the movie, exactly the same story happens. And this was a revelation to me. It's like, wow, I could be spinning on all this stuff all this time, and I am not actually having an effect on anything. And I thought that was a very interesting thing. And it's when I really started to constrict and become more uh, interested in the domain of change that I can affect, which is a lot smaller than I thought it was. But it's also been a lot more meaningful. Um, is, and that's really been interesting, is, is the connection with a small group or one person or a random interaction has been really interesting to me that I actually am doing something, I feel like, even on a, you know, on a human scale, because I'm just one. 
Now, one person can communicate with many, many, but um, so the only other thing I wanted to toss out there is there was a comment about, you know, why are humans so crappy to each other all the time? And, and um, you know, my first response is that, well, we seem to want people to be different. We want reality to be different than it is. And I think Doug has always been a proponent of saying, well, we need to, we need to accept it. We need to work with it. It has to, this is not, we're not going to change that some people are more power-driven or disagreeable or whatever it happens to be, um, at least not on a scale of billions of people. And so how do we work with that? But, but more importantly, I think the comment was, why are humans so crappy to other people without having any reason, without any justification? Well, what about this? Why are humans so generous and kind to each other without any reason or cause or justification? I mean, it doesn't make any sense if we're if we're out in the in the woods living by ourselves. Like what what is it what is it that draws us to say, you know what, I don't have any reason going out of my way to help this other person is a, is I mean, could be argued as a, as a drain of some kind. You're spending some of your life to do that. So why do we do that? Because that's been my experience is that more people I know are kind and generous and go out of their way and share and go without and donate. I mean, they give their life, which is their time. It's all you've got. And they're giving their life to help someone else. And I think it's real easy to say, yeah, everybody's so horrible to everybody else. Why is that? And I think, well, yeah, if you if that's your if that's the lenses that you've got on right now, and then that's all you see. But I just am not experiencing that in the people that I interact with actually, like the actual people who are next to me, not what I'm reading about, but what actually what I'm when I'm really engaged with people, I'm finding them to be, well, to be flawed and wonderful, but generous, generally speaking, and willing to accept and forgive. And, and you know, it's when we're talking about and mass that it's easier to say that everybody's terrible to everybody else. And I don't think that's true. Um, Scott, I'll just respond to you for a sec before going to Pete in the queue. Um, I have the same felt experience and lived experience, I think, as you do, and partly because you and I surround ourselves by people like the folks who show up on this call, who are, I think, in general, altruistic and helpful and generous and well-spirited and, and so forth. Um, my fear is that people who mean well and live well succumb to other people's structures and forces who I think are in the minority on the planet, I, I really do, but who find ways to run the table and create systems like caste systems that tear, like, tear holes in the social fabric and destroy people's lives senselessly and meaninglessly. And I'm trying to figure out what are defense mechanisms so that the people who are trying to do well by each other are the general winners and don't get subjugated and subjected to the other people's structures and force. And, and there's a general broad question of how do peaceful societies survive assaults by warrior societies, which is unfortunately um, happens all the time uh, and is happening actively on the planet right now. Um, so that, that that's the general tenor. I, I agree entirely that, that my life experience is that I, interact all the time and, and that's partly through choices and how we are in the world and who we attract around us go ahead scott just a 30 second response to that my brain is going to my thursday night hockey league which is a bunch of police and fire and pilots and a pinball league that i play in once a week these are a bunch of random people from all ends of the spectrum income education, all that stuff. And it's not a group that I intentionally chose other than I want to play hockey on Thursday nights. I want to play pinball on Monday nights. Okay. And that's been my experience is that every single one of them would roll over to help me in a way that would be enormously challenging. You know, like, I don't, I don't get it. Like they'll always defer to, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make this good. And so, again, I don't think it's because I've sought out some um, 
open, welcoming group. I, I've just found a group of people who happen to be getting together and they all, they're, they self-manage, they, they have their, who's in charge? Well, it's kind of loose, you know, it's, it's self-organizing and, and I just think it's, um, yeah, I don't think it's because I found, a, tried to find a group that was open-minded. But they wanted to be a group. And even just that instinct leads you toward some kinds of behavior that are group forming behaviors. There's a whole bunch of research also on altruism and all that. I'll paste a study in the chat that I found in my brain as you were talking uh, in a sec. Uh, and th thanks for that observation, Scott. Uh, Pete, Gil, Jose, Stacy. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm gonna say three different things. I apologize for trying to pack everything in. Um, the first one, the first one is I really like when people testify about their life, what's going on in their, you know, their experience, their lived experience, um, which is a weird way to say that um, I want to say without intending uh, harm on anyone or intending to influence anyone, I want to say that in my life, my wife and I are still COVID cautious. Um, the scientists that we listen to say that you should probably mask whenever you're around people that you don't live with. Um, with a, a reasonable mask and N95 respirator, they're called, um, and uh, and that every time you catch COVID, you have a significant risk of of worsening your health. It gets it multiplies. It doesn't, you know. Uh, this is something that we don't hear from uh, mainstream um, like the CDC. Um, I think that's for political reasons. It's not for health reasons. So take it as you will. Um, uh, I, I, I really like Eve, your question. Um, it's a great question. And I know that I'm not actually somatically affected by, by things much. Um, think I'm, I'm blessed with a body that's fairly stable. Um, I am hypersensitive though. Parts of that is in my body. Some like I get rashes and stuff like that, but I'm hypersensitive emotionally and, um, injustice or things like that hit me really hard. Um, I have a, uh, an amazing and tragic thing to relate, which is that um, a couple of years ago uh, with increasing gun violence in the US, I had to come to terms with that because every time we had a school shooting or something like that, um, I would be like brain fogged for a couple of days. And it's like, okay, so I, I get it. I, so I, I came to terms with that with myself and I'm not proud of this and I don't like it. I really hate it. But it was like, well, okay, well, Pete, you happen to live in a society that values its, for whatever reason, it's, I think it's not the individuals, I think it's structural stuff, but there's structural stuff that makes it so that our society finds it really important to <laughs> have its guns and make them available to anybody and especially people who are unbalanced. And so the, the result of that is that, you know, um, regularly, statistically, you know, every, you know, every couple of weeks, there's going to be people who are getting shot up, innocent people getting killed, a lot of them kids, et cetera, et cetera. So I made my peace with that. It's like, okay, I live in a society where that's what we've decided where we've come to. We draw the balance between individual liberty and gun ownership at, at the place where it means that there's going to be a thousand, 10,000, I don't know what, you know, some number of thousands of tragic shootings uh, every year. And so I'm like, okay, that's where I live. So when I hear the news of the next shooting, it's not two days of brain fog. It's like, well, um, I guess I move on. It's, um, it's tragic. Um, I, I, I would like to expand your question, Eve. Um, uh, another thing that, that hurts me just as much as people being bad to other people is people being bad to animals non-human um, residents of the planet it like it pisses me off even more actually and you know and and there are people who do that on purpose and a lot of us spend our lives kind of willfully ignorant of how how humans are treating animals and and or nature and getting away with it right um so why are people so bad to you know i mean it, for for me the way it works for me it's like you know at least if you're being terrible to people in your family, the hum humans, you know, that's one thing. But when you're going to somebody else's family and shitting on them, it's like, 
come on, you know, don't we, don't we, didn't your mom teach you better than that? Didn't your grandma like hit you upside the head once or twice and say, don't do that. Don't be a terrible person. It drives me completely bananas. And, and yet it's another thing where I kind of have to live with it. I, I think into that question of why are people, why are people bad to other people? Why are so many people bad to other people? One of them, the, the, a thing to note, like Scott said, I think most people are great and wonderful and, and well-meaning and generous and helpful and things like that. And so into that mix, I see a couple different things. And I, when you differentiate them, you see them like you see them better. So one of them is there are a few people who are, for whatever reason, mostly trauma or brain problems or something like that. They're horrible. They're psychopathic. They're sociopathic. There aren't many people like that. Um, and they need help, actually. Um, and we need to figure out as a society, society to help them better. But there aren't many like that. So then there's another structural thing like castes. Uh, where the way that we've, you know, the way that society evolved ended up meaning that, you know, there's, there's a, a tendency for some people to want to be on top of other people and some, some other people, unfortunately, get to be on the bottom of that, that relationship. So there's structural things that happen, and those are really hard to change. I think in the past, especially with, uh, so yet another thing that's happened, you know, over the last I don't know, 150 years, something like that, where we've gotten good at propaganda and then um, social media happened and, and it just went wild. I think there are powerful people in the world who decided that they know the world better than everybody else. And they're going to purposely trash big parts of society just so that they can get what they think is more fair or more better. And it's the weirdest thing to watch um, but I think a lot of the stuff that we deal with in life is some, you know, multi-billionaire um, who is largely a multi-billionaire because of luck and maybe like family history and stuff like that. They got to a place where they said, you know, I'm going to shift the world. I'm going to make the world different. I'm going to make um, uh, unfairness uh, uh, in this part of society. And that unfairness is going to cause what I want to happen, right? Um, and it's crazy making. And so back to coming to the people who are really affected by seeing unfairness in the world, I've learned one of the things that you need to do is to not get sucked into like mistaking one of those kinds of uh, bad people for the other kind and realizing that a lot of times people are acting badly because they're playing out a script or forces that are much larger than themselves. Um, that sounds really crazy and, and abstract, but um, uh, I, I watch people caught up with, why are these people being unfair to us? Can't they see that, that what they're doing is unfair? And it's actually a social engineering hack that are making those people act unfairly. It's not, you know, it's not what they believe. Lastly, um, it keeps coming up for me. I wish there were a place to have uh, important conversations in, um, in a community forum. Um, I feel like I know the technology for that. We used it for OGM forum. Um, it's software called Discourse. Um, I keep wanting to set up a community forum for that. Um, I can't do it by myself, and especially I can't run the community that decides if we're having good conversations or bad conversations and helping more people join that, the good conversations there. Um, if you're interested in that, um, I, I guess I'll start talking about that more, make a project, um, and maybe we can uh, create a, a public place for better discussions. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Bill, Jose, Stacy, and feel free to take your time stepping in. Let me see if I can be compact with this. I appreciate the points that Jerry and Eve and Pete raised, and there's a thread among them for me. Um, and I'm I'm provoked and frustrated by all of them. <laughs> um, so Eve, um, I like your question 
except for the part about what would we call these people. So I'm not interested in categorizing or labeling or putting any kind of box around it because these are qualities that are there and not there uh, with all of us some of the time in varying degrees. And so the qualities I'm very interested in, but the, the naming I'm not. Um, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm like you, I am, I am deeply baffled by the cruelty that I encounter uh, in the world that comes to me through media and so forth. I fortunately don't see a lot of it in my personal life. Um, but it struck me these last few years, something very different between callousness and indifference and not caring um, compared to an, what seems like an act of cruelty not act of active a a c t i v e and, and, and it baffles me um but it seems to me that there are not just two moves to make one is to be crushed by it and go into a tailspin and the other is to just say that's how it is and move on there's a third option which i think is kind of where most of us tend to be which is you know um how can i be an agent of change in that how can i help move things in some way so that it becomes less normal and less expected. And, you know, for me, one of the resonant examples of that, and it may be as trite by now, but, you know, when I came of age and was learning how to drive, it was cool to be able to drink and hold your liquor and drive. It was considered cool. It was considered like an elevated sign of masculine bullshit of some sort. Uh, and because a couple of mothers who had lost their daughters to drunk drivers got totally fed up with it. That has changed in this culture. And it took some time and it still happens, but the norm is different. It's no longer cool in most society. Um, it's the behavior has shifted, the acceptance has shifted. Um, and so, um, um, you know, they somehow took themselves out of a mood of resignation. Like, oh, well, this is how it is. It really sucks. There's nothing I can do about it. It's the human condition. It's human nature. There's nothing to be done. And this is a mood that a lot of us live in all the time. You know, it's just how it is. Nothing can be done, which is different than, um, you know, a more a more serene acceptance of this is how it is. And now what do I what do I do with that? Um, Jerry takes me back to your question, um, which is. A good question, except for the last three words. Not like us. You said, why are humans so consistently shitty to other humans all the time? All the time. Okay. And a number of people have flagged that in this conversation. You even did. How about so often? No, no. What I want to get at is something else. The okay. more, more interesting question to me is why did you ask that question? Or put it another way, why did you formulate your discomfort in those words, which, what, you know, what mood were you speaking out of when you said that? What was your, you know, what was your assessments of the world that you were speaking out of that had you add those three words that really profoundly changed the question? Interesting. I'm wondering how it changes the question for you. I'd love to hear more about that. And I think, I think well, origin... Well, Go ahead. I think Origin put me in the same frame of mind as Hidden Figures and The Green Mile and a series of movies that have dramatized. Um, and I'm not a big fan of over-dramatization and all that kind of stuff. I love the dogma movement. But hey, these movies did a really good job of dramatizing situations in which um, systemic injustice was just perpetrated on people who had been born. like they, They'd lost the birth roulette, basically. That's all. Yeah. That's all. They've been born into a place and 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 people which the dominant caste system of their society deemed inferior. And it's just horrifying. And it happens to very large swaths of the planet. Um, and the the job that Wilkerson does really well in cast and that I think Origin uncovers really well is the job of saying, hey, this isn't really about race, it's about caste. And that's how she glues together uh American uh basically slavery in the U.S. And, and prejudice against Black people in the U.S. with the caste system in India, with the Nazi persecution of Jews and the Holocaust. And she makes a very strong case that those things are all of a kind. So um, if you'll permit me, please, uh, 
you just gave a very brainiac answer to a very personal question. So I was asking you about what, you know, what, what is the mood and interpretation that, you, that the question you asked rose out of? Look, if the question is, why are humans shitty to other humans? I get it. You know, that animates me and a lot of, well, I think a lot of us here. But to turn that into why are humans so consistently shitty to humans all the time is speaking to me more about you than about the nature of humans in the world. Um, I'm wondering if that hits other people the same way. And what I mean is that for such long stretches of human history, overwhelming numbers of humans have been subjected to systems that do this to them. Maybe. Really long stretches, like huge. And it's ongoing today all over the place. And we talk about the things are getting better. Look, infant mortality is down and poverty is rising. And I'm like, yeah, but people are still being shitty to other people constantly and the systems that they live inside of are kind of authorizing it and and <clears throat> reinforcing it. all the and i and i say all the time because my perception of it is that possibly and i haven't run stats on this the majority of the population for a big chunk of history not all of time has been in this kind of way and I am a person of privilege. I kind of won the birth lotto. I'm a white male born in the US, uh, living in the US. I am unlikely to be subjected to these kinds of things. And I think I feel a considerable guilt for that um, and want to be helpful to people who are suffering from this. Um, also, my family barely escaped Germany in 39. There is uh, a quarter of me is Ashkenazim. And but for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here at all, or I would be persecuted. And that factors in some as well. I don't, I don't want to monopolize this between the two of us, but I, just, I do want to say one thing. You said you haven't run stats on this, but you're speaking as though you have. That's all I'm saying. Um, I think a lot of us generalize from what we perceive or see or have read or felt, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm probably uh, generalizing a bunch. Uh, I... You know, if you think of the caste system in India, that's a huge number of humans subjected to this systematically. If you think of casta in South America, which the uh, uh, Spaniards and Portuguese basically brought and imposed yeah, on Africa, yeah, yeah, like yeah, colonialism. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, you can stack up all the evidence that you want, and we all know it, and it's there, and it's real, and I don't mean to deny it at all. But Scott, for example, and others are talking about the experience of, of human life lived and human compassion and care and nurturance and advancement. And to your comment that this has always been this way, I would just go back to, you know, to our friends. Gray, Gray, I Gray. did not say this has always been this way. I did I definitely did not say that. You said all of human history. No, I said through much of history, most people, most of the time. But for me, Wengro and Graeber are saying, hey, idiots. There's other ways of organizing society. That's why I'm doing the governance calls after this, because I believe this is a much better way. And I think part of the problem is freeing ourselves of these artificially created caste institutions that keep us from doing the natural things that humans would like to do, which are about altruism, cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're pushing your, your, the needle right into the right place, I think. But I'm not saying that this has always been this way at all. I'm saying, why do so many people suffer under these artificial systems, which are unnecessary and not the natural way for humans to be? So, to, to my ears, so many is a better phrase. So many works well, yeah. and and I'm really appreciating that you pointed out what words and what I was saying didn't work for you at all. So that's great. Yeah. That and helps I'll, me a bunch. And I'll and stop. We, let other people dive in. Thanks, Gil. And we've got a bunch of people and only 10 minutes left in our official call. But thanks for, uh, being, thanks for being open to the poke. Thanks, Gil. Really, I, and I really appreciate it. Jose, then Stacy, then Klaus, because Stacy, I think you filled out of the queue earlier. Um, so let's go. Jose, Stacy, Klaus. Um, so <laughs> I, I sorry, there's only 10 minutes and three of us to to speak. So I'll try to be quick. Um First of all, I, I think we know why people do what they do. Um, we we know that uh, 
as a community, we can alter the way we see other people. We can alter the way we see animals. We can alter the way we see um, nature by telling stories about what those things are. And that's it. That's as simple as I think the story is. And uh, we can we can dehumanize other humans. We can call them vermin. We can call them all kinds of other things, uh, godless and whatever else. And before you know it, we're at war. Before you know it, we can take 18-year-old kids to go over there and kill those vermin because those 18-year-old kids believe what we told them. Um, and I think that that aspect of us is one that we don't talk enough about, that we don't focus on the reality of, as organisms, we are influenced by the stories that we tell. And the most fundamental story that I think Sorry, I'm getting a, I'm just getting a call. Um, I think the most fundamental story that we all have, or most of us have, and share with one another is that, and it was said today a couple of times, uh, that we're imperfect, that we're, um, that humans are are broken, that we're not, um, that somehow there's such a thing as perfection and that somehow there's such a thing as being human that is more or less different than being an organism that's capable of learning how to act. And then if I learn how to act in an environment that causes me to act poorly, then I'm as human as everybody else, but it's that environment that created me in part. Um, and so how do I blame others for their environment and their stories and their influences and forces in the, on their lives for their behavior? I think we give ourselves way too much credit for being able to think out of the box when society has hemmed us in. We're neither good nor evil is my view. And the only thing that makes us so is the stories we believe. So I'm, I'm confused because it seems like you've said two, in my mind, contradictory things, which is on the one hand, hey, societies are easily shaped by narratives and stories, which I totally agree with. There's a thought in my brain that says we are in a titanic battle over the narrative narratives in our head or the uh, you know ideas in our head, stories are the the, the, the weapon or whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll place the link in the chat. And then you said, oh, and who are we to accuse other people of their story? And there's no way we can change this. We should just muddle through is what I heard you say in addition to that. No, I'm not saying that there's no way we can change it. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to change it. But what we shouldn't do is attack the individuals. Okay. What we should do is attack the stories. Okay. Then so, so it's a tactic. It's tactical advice in some sense. Cool. Thanks, Jose. Thank you. Uh, uh, Stacy, then Klaus. So what I was going to say is that for most people, when we're interacting with somebody else, we're largely impacted by the amount, by the perceived threat that we have from the other person. And I don't mean physical threat. I mean, threat to an idea, whatever. And I suspect to what Jerry alluded to in terms of Scott's group, that there are a certain amount of individuals in that group that resonate at the same level, the same heart level as Scott do, as Scott does. There are probably also some un other individuals that don't, but they're elevated by the group. And to Jose's point, the story that they know because they're in relationship with each other. Um, I forgot the second part of where I was going with that now. So I started thinking about Jose. Um, I can stop there. <laughs> That's all right. I sometimes use the chat to just type things in without entering them, just as a as a placeholder, so I don't forget things I want to I want to say. Oh, that's that's what I wanted to say. To Scott See, it came right back. What I what I would ask you, Scott, is like when you said that they would do that, you know, for you and the whole group is like that. My question, what I would suspect is that there are some people in that group 
that would do that for Gil or Klaus or anyone, even if they didn't know them, but other people that would only extend themselves in that way to you based on how well they know you. And like I said before, there's no threat there. And there's support. It's a, it's a very interesting comment, Stacey. And there was a comment I was about to put in the chat, but I deleted it and now it seems relevant again. This group seems to say, yeah, but a lot. And by yeah, but I mean, um, you know, well, maybe I did put it in the chat that, that we're somehow acknowledging the good and the 12 people in the group that are awesome, apart from the two people who are kind of jerks, you know, um, to your point, it's like somehow that acknowledging that or celebrating that is disrespectful to the serious concern for the negative, you know, and I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm just saying that I'm entering into this group and my general perception is that everyone's getting along and maybe they're all pulling towards a a better place because there's 12 who are great and two who are not. I, who knows? Um, but I'm really not in inclined to say, oh yeah, but yeah, there's those two who are awful. And if I talk about how awesome this group is, I'm really not acknowledging that those two are there and that's that's going to taint it looks like the, the little drop of black paint in a bucket of yellow you know it's like do i really want that to to color the whole thing i don't know i i'm not i'm not inclined to do that and i feel like we tend to do that where we see one thing of good news and then we say yes but if i just go bigger then we've got what is it racism and murder and and starvation and caste and and, and we can always pile on all of the negative and to me that's a horrible way to live because that's not how i want to see things um yeah there's there's all those things going on but why would i want to only surround myself with the vision of that but i don't know call me pollyanna or naive all right pollyanna um Scott, you've just opened up another hour's conversation and we've only got a couple minutes in this call, but I appreciate what you just said and kind of want to bank it and, and bring it back in maybe next week or something like that because because these are all really good places to start. Let's go Klaus and Ken, and I'm hoping also Ken has a poem in his pocket for us. Yeah, I'm just thinking as I'm you know, listening in on our conversation, the most consistent story uh, throughout history you know, has been how societies have framed a narrative that turned them into a warrior uh, uh, caste, you know, the Mongolians and the Roman Empire and what have you, or into a relatively stable and peaceful society, um, and how uh, throughout time the, the uh, tendency for aggression has created this race to the bottom over and over, you know, and tossed over and, and changed what could have been a benign and peaceful society. And so today we have a big battle over narrative again. Now, there are a number of, of thinkers, you know, I'm thinking about Sorokin, for example, or Michio Kaku, who have defined this era that we are living in right now as a transition phase that is that is critical in advancing us uh, to live in harmony with our environment, to maintain a living planet, um, because we have reached numbers and volumes and impact that are just uh, uh, that that no longer uh, allow a civilization to pack up and move to a different location. The, the planet is full and, and packed. So we have to change the narrative that, that drives us. Um, and I don't think, you know, we are talking about this later, but I don't think the political system in itself um, matters much. What matters is the story that people have uh, come to embrace and to believe in and act out on. You know? And and that's where you know right now we can see the 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 way that we are struggling to to find a path forward uh, we have all the technology we have all the knowledge you know to 
to radically change the way we interact with uh, within our own societies and with others and with the planet itself, but we don't have the story to guide that. Um, so that's really where it's a it's a fight over narratives. You know, and, uh, and 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 I think the major uh, uh, philosophers and thinkers of our time are all basically on that very same theme. Thanks, Klaus. I'll be very brief, and I do have a poem. Thanks. Um, Jose, you're back. You're about to leave. But I was going to comment on your thing about um, things are far more mysterious than I think we are. A couple of weeks ago, Jerry was talking about being part of constellation. Um, I stood in a constellation, represented somebody, and um, I said something that I apologized for because I thought it was a very flippery remark. And I was told afterwards by the person who knew who I was representing, no, no, that was exactly what he would say. There are there are fields we interact with that are beyond our ability to know that have profound impact on us. So that's my comment. Um, I don't normally choose a poem before uh, before our calls because I, I try to you know source from the call what's going on. But I chose this, and and I think it actually works really well. And I I chose it also because it's it's February, it's Black History Month, and I thought I would honor my Angelo. So. Um, you probably all know the name of this. It's Caged Bird. <clears throat> a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun's rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on a distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn-bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts, a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. His tune is heard on a distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great call. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I will see some of you in 24, 26 minutes uh, when we'll start the next call. Same Zoom on governance. Let's see if we can get someplace on that. But thank you a lot. Uh, feel free to suggest on the Mattermost channel or elsewhere topics how to frame our next call, which is not a check-in call, but rather a topic call here. So 8 a.m. next Thursday, how would you like us to lead in there, let loose on the Mattermost channel, please, or on the OGM list if you prefer. But thank you so much. Thank you all. Well.